And I just realized. Uh, welcome, 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 everyone. It's the top of the hour. So we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Shannon Martin Roebuck. I'm executive director at Bridging Impact. And my co-host today is the fabulous Jose Ocaño, who's the, <laughs> the founder and CEO of Hatching. Today's topic is Natives in Vet Med, a guided facilitation of their journey, moments of enlightenment, and vision for the future. And now I think it's time for national updates. If anyone has any to share, please feel free to unmute yourself and share, or you can also drop something in the chat. Uh, Jose, would you jump in and start us yeah. off? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So as y'all start getting ready for your national update, something we want to let everybody know is that our weekly community conversation calls have become so popular that we've reached the maximum capacity of registrants. So starting for the May 6th call and moving forward, um, you'll need to re-register and start using the new link. Um, that information will be here in the chat. After registering, you'll receive a confirmation email with the new link, which you can add to your calendar. You can re-register today and be good to go for May 6th. And also just a note, we won't have calls the, the next few weeks. Our first set of calls after this one will actually be May 6th. So we hope to see all of you um, there and thank you for being part of this community. And with that, let's jump into those national updates. Hey, it's Kathy from Canada again. <laughs> hola, hola. Hola. Uh, Y'all still have time to register for our upcoming Summit for Animals, which is May 5th, 6th, and 7th. So if you are at the Summit for Animals in Halifax, you won't be able to attend the May 6th call in person. But you can always watch the recording of these and still get credit. See y'all uh -huh. on the flip side. See you on the flippity flip. Awesome. Gracias, Kathy from Canada. Anybody else have some national updates? You can also put them in the chat if you're more comfortable sharing that way. All right. What I'd love to do then is let's talk about the question of the day, because I think the question of the day is actually going to go really nicely into our conversation. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for providing this really beautiful question. And the question is, name a mentor in your field that showed you this work was a possibility. Shannon, I'm curious, who was someone that is that for you? I have to think on that one. Um, it was really hard for me coming in from higher education. And so I think... Um, the person I replaced at Capital Humane Society was very adamant in, in guiding me to attend some conferences. And that is what was really pivotal for me because I got to meet a lot of you folks. And I would say collectively, you all have been just a great inspiration and, and mentors for me. I can't say it was any one specific person. It was just a group of folks who helped me and guided me. Oh, I love that. I was reflecting on this question and I remember the first person that really, I remember thinking about possibilities was a man named Dr. Martin Almada. He's my best friend's dad. He's someone who comes from such challenging circumstances and ascended to get a PhD, was one of the first Latinos to teach in higher education at Harvard, and is now the president of Apache College um, in Arizona. And he was the first Latino that I saw achieve something. I didn't see someone who looked like me, who came from where I came from, who was achieving things and the way that he navigated these spaces while still maintaining himself and always speaking Spanish and Spanglish was something that I like loved. And to this day, like I bring Spanish into everything that I do because it's who I am. So I love that. And it's really cool to see some of these, some of these animal, some of these animals, some of these answers <laughs> in the chat, <laughs> Freudian slip, I guess. This is beautiful. And, you know, I just do not want to have us wait any longer. I am so excited for this conversation. And we are blessed that Dr. Renee Taylor, Ray Taylor um, has agreed to facilitate this conversation so that we can hear the lived experience from the folks from Natives and Vet Med. I think this is going to be a really wonderful conversation to just really root ourselves 
in perspectives that we often don't get to listen to or understand. And so with that, I just want to introduce um, Dr. Taylor. She is a veterinarian who works with all species of animals from honeybees to elephants, but spends most of the time with companion animals and horses. She has worked in the clinical, community, regulatory, and university settings, and currently is a senior veterinary medical officer for CARE, that is Companions and Animals for Reform and Equity, a wonderful organization. As a Red Lake Nation descendant, service to community has been central to her work, focusing efforts to embody servant leadership. He joins us today as an advisor to Natives in Vet Med. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Floor is yours. Thank you, Chima Gwetch. Uh, buzu, buzu, and and in a way, manaduk, ray uh, indishnikaz. I'm so happy to be able to be here with you, and uh, thank you, Maddie, for this opportunity to really let these amazing humans shine. And this work is so inspirational that I hope that you guys leave here with that inspiration as well. I'm going to hand it off to each of them and let them introduce. Um, Summer, if we could start with you. Colorado um, Colorado State University at Wabarawa. So hello, my relatives. Um, it's good to meet to see you all. I greet all of you with a good heart. Um, my name is Summer. I am a current second year veterinary student attending Colorado State University. Um, and I am one of the co-founders and the vice president for Natives in VetMed. Um, I said, I introduced myself in Dakota because I'm enrolled in the system Wapitanoyate. We are a tribe located in the northeastern corner of South Dakota. Piramaya. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Alicia. Um, Colorado and uh, so hi everyone my name is Lisa Mata I am currently a um, second year master student at Colorado State University um, I am an enrolled member of Red Lake Band of Ojibwe um, and that is in northern Minnesota um, but my family is also descends from Standing Rock and Navajo Nation. Um, and I'm one of the other founders for Natives in Vet Med. Um, and I'm currently serving as the president. I'm really glad to be here and see everyone. So. Thank you. Hila. Hello everyone. My name is my English name is Kayla. I fortunate enough I just received my Ojibwe name, which is Majikamigukwe or Moving Path Woman. I am from a Bad River Reservation, which is in northern Wisconsin, right on the shores of Lake Superior. Um, I am currently working in the neighboring town of Ashton, Wisconsin, as a certified veterinary technician in a mixed animal practice, and I am just excited to be here one of the co-founders of Names and Vet Med as well. I'm um, currently the Midwest represent or Midwest representative for Names and Vet Med as well. Thank you. Jerlene. Hi, Yad A Shikeda Shidana Shay Jerlene Salva Yanishia. Kia Ani Nishle, Ma Itushkij ni Bashishin, Ashihin Tashiche, Torajini Tashinale, Akut Eko Tana Nishle, Tohache De Ianshi Nasha. Shama to Shije, a Darlene Manly to Salabai, don't Mike Salabai, will ya? Hi, my name is Jerilyn Salabai. Um, I am Towering House, born for the Coyote Pass clan. My maternal grandfather's clan is Bitterwater, and my maternal grandfather's clan is Salt People clan. Um, I'm a young Nampo woman. I am going to school here at New Mexico State University. This is my fourth year, and I'll be graduating next semester. And um, my role in Natives and Vet Med, I serve as secretary right now. And um, for my goal um, as an undergraduate is to apply for veterinary school and hopefully continue my studies. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Beautiful group of humans. We're going to walk through some questions um, with this group today. And hopefully you guys, if you've got any questions for this team, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them later. So let's talk about what Natives in VetMed actually is and who they are, what the mission is. So Kayla, could you walk us through that? I'd be happy to. So we started a couple of years ago. Um, one of our mentors who was not on the call, she noticed there were not so many Native American students in veterinary medicine that she um, knew of that were volunteering at spay and neuter clinics and whatnot in the Midwest. And we're like, yep, we're gonna change that and we're gonna get together. And since then, um, we have become a 501c3. Paperwork is, I believe, final. If not, it's in the final stages. Um, and we mainly have this group to show that there are natives in the veterinary field. Um, we just form community in our meetings and extend that um, nationwide. I believe we might even have some in Canada, if not, um, we're, we're getting there. Um, but one of the things that we do is um, we just foster connections. We support indigenous students in their journeys. Um, I was in my last semester of vet tech school um, when this started and just knowing that there are around me that are going through the same thing um, was amazing. So we're looking to keep this going. Thank you. Summer, would you want to add into any of that? Like what did you form this group or what were those driving reasons? Yeah, so I think for myself and maybe speaking a little bit for everybody else, like we really wanted to make sure that we had representation within the veterinary medicine field. Um, I think when, through my experience, when I looked around, I saw that there were a lot of groups um, that were coming to reservations and providing veterinary care. Um, I, one of my like defining moments was actually when I was maybe like 12, 13, one of those clinics came to the res and I went and volunteered with them. Um, but it's a really distinct experience. I think when you look around and you see yourself as the only one there, right? The only brown person, the only native person at the clinic. Um, and I remember that being kind of like, oh, is this field kind of for me right now? Like nobody else here looks like me or has my same experiences. And so a big reason for natives in vet med is for us to create camaraderie between each other um, so that we can have that representation together and then also kind of push our, push our way into different spaces. Um, I think another big part of forming Natives in Vet Med is that for us, I think our reasoning behind why we want to do veterinary medicine or be involved in the field stems from sort of a different place than maybe non-Native counterparts. And by that, I mean, a lot of our beliefs stem from, or at least if, or more specifically to speak for myself as a Dakota person, one of our beliefs is which means reciprocity. Um, and so it really is just one of our traditional values of giving back. Um, it doesn't necessarily come from a place of like philanthropy, which is obviously nothing wrong with that, but it's really a way of life for us. Um, one of our big teachings, right, is that we are not necessarily wealthy by like defined by in the amount that we have ourselves, but more so rather by the amount that we give away. And that's how we define wealth in my community. Um, and so for a lot of Native people, that does actually tend to be the case. And so with Natives in Vet Med, this is our way of giving back. And this is our way of being able to go back into our communities and do that work ourselves. That is a great call out that the way of life is just different. You know, we have, then you give, and that is wealth. And that is an honor to be able to do that. And for those of you that don't come from that culture, there are many people, non-natives that want to help. Um, but sometimes unfortunately that can lead to some intentional harm, unintentional harm. So one opportunity that we can have to avoid that is if you're not a native person and you're wanting to work in that realm is to work on your own cultural humility, cultural competence and awareness. Lisa, could you walk us through what that might look like that is unique in many native populations? 
Yeah, um, I appreciate mentioning the unintentional harm because I think good intentions are well in tuned, well the um, the follow through of that can look different. So something I always like to say, um, as I've been recently being able to do more cultural competency training as I've been out here in Colorado, um, is being aware of the space you're taking up. And I don't mean that in a physical aspect. Um, it can be if we're looking at a surface level, but um, when I say be aware of the space you're taking up, being aware that you don't need to be the front in the front row asking all the questions. Um, direct eye contact is actually kind of seen as aggressive and rude in a lot of tribal nations um, or asking six questions in the span of five minutes and not giving someone the time to answer each question fully, um, which I think is a really big issue, especially in vet med because we're trained to um, get as much information as we can as short as time as we can um, to maximize our time. Whereas in indigenous communities where a lot of us are, we're storytellers. So they, so them telling you a story, which to you might not seem relevant to them, it's relevant. That's why they're bringing it up. Um, and allowing for that storytelling to listen to the story. Um, a lot of things I see, especially um, working with the veterinary students um, and techs and assistants is they're coming in for the experience rather. And this ties back to what Summer said of the reason we're doing this is a lot. It stems from a different place. Um, and so remembering that although you're there to learn in your technical and your education, you're also there to learn from the community and it's a partnership. So um, yeah, I'm just being aware of the space you take up is something I recommend to all people who are volunteering with indigenous communities. I think bringing up that necessary self-awareness is key no matter where we're doing work, but especially in this space. Now, Geraldine, I was wondering if you could help us understand the rest of these intelligent humans uh, happen to be the co-founders, but you're not. So tell us about your journey, how you got involved with Natives and Vet Med and what your experience has been like. <laughs> well, um, first I met Summer through an internship I was taking um, and she got an opportunity to um, come to the Navajo Nation, work under Dr. Day with, at Navajo Technical University. And together we were able to vaccinate, travel across Napo, a part, um, yeah, just like a piece of Napo Nation. And we're able to go to house to house, um, specifically to an elder's house and help um, vaccinate their sheep and deworm them and all that. But anyway, so as we were doing that, um, we were stopping at a chapter house for lunch, which typically was just a sandwich. <laughs> but um I really never um, heard of Natives in Bet Med. I didn't know it was an organization, but until Summer mentioned it, I was just like, yes, I need to be a part of that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, just her and I sitting outside of a chapter house eating sandwiches in our overalls, dusty, after working sheep. That's how I learned about it. <laughs> Great. And you were able to actually go on a different trip specifically for Natives and Met Vet Med. Could you tell us what that was like? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, as Summer and I were talking at the chapter house, um, she was mentioning this opportunity that we could take um, a trip down to South Dakota to do to run a clinic. And on the Sissington Reservation, I believe. And um it was really cool just because I don't personally travel out of state that much. I don't have like, there's not a lot of um, like veterinary um, opportunities close to home. So being able to have a scholarship and have a sponsor to fly out um, to South Dakota and um, be introduced to all these great people in this program and being able to work with them and I'm personally not a small animals type of person. I mostly work with larger animals. So working with smaller animals was a good experience and I learned so much that day. Thank you for sharing your experience. It's amazing that we can have this network and build it um, even further. 
one of the things that I hear a lot from people outside of the indigenous cultures is wondering how they can help and how they can get into that. Um, but there are some key things. I wonder if Summer and then Lisa, if you guys could just um, mention, what do you think would be important things to really remember when working with indigenous peoples? Yeah, so I think one of the big things for me is that it's really important to prioritize Native partnerships. And so I think, especially for like organizations that do work on reservations, I think if you're not actively bringing the community in or bringing in other Native representation, that you can kind of be missing the mark a little bit. And that's not to take away from any of the really good work. But if we really want to make things sustainable, right, in these communities that are lacking veterinary care, we need to be able to support the students who want to become veterinarians, right? So that way they can go back to their communities and they can have a clinic and they can do all of this work outside of the one or two weeks, right, that these organizations are in these communities. That's how we make long-term change and that's how we make it really sustainable, right? Because that's how you're supporting those students to come back to their communities too. Um, and so that's just like one example, but that's really kind of, I think, the big thing for me is always just prioritize those Native partnerships, right? Like representation really matters and representation is what's going to make help make that change. And to add to that, um, as Summer mentioned, the sustainability of these relationships, um, acknowledging the history with Indigenous communities um, ever since the first contact with um, European settlers. There have been broken promises that are even written in treaties and broken treaties, and then things that we're supposed to follow up with that that promised education to um, our children, to our people, that promised housing, and these things have not been followed through um, till this day for a lot of communities. And so the importance of the long-term commitments, um, if you're able to go for a week then are you gonna be able to go back next year for those vaccines that need to be updated or for those dogs that tested positive or something and need to be rechecked um, and how you are committing to that. Um, I think the good intention is you can come in for a weekend and say we've seen 150 animals and that's great, but then what happens after that? So following through and making those long-term commitments um, and that includes building trust with the communities um, Again, they're not very trustful of outsiders. They've been harmed and they've been hurt from um, many historically and still currently today. So um, really being aware of when you decide you want to take the step to make those partnerships, acknowledging all of the history and the things of how you're going to make your things sustainable um with this community and how you're going to partner with them it's not you coming with them to help them so they don't um you know they're not looking for help they're looking to see how they can utilize resources that can increase their community um their community support for themselves so those are kind of critical call outs thank you for sharing those it is incredible when we work with the community to really stop, pause, and reflect on those moments. And instead of going in, taking all of your knowledge and placing it upon a place, instead it's giving the space to talk and ask what a community needs, what a community wants, and what's prioritized for them, what's important to them, and to see if your group, your organization can facilitate that. It's not about saving. It's not about um, what is working on the philanthropy side. It's about being an altruistic human and partnering with that particular group. And one of the other things that we talk about in preparing our students and which led to our question of the day was to talk about even the barriers that you're facing. So one of the barriers that we hear a lot about is about education. And regardless of what type of education that is, it's education in general. Um, Kayla, I was wondering if you could talk to us about the, your experience in education, like why you chose to become a veterinary technician and what that education journey was like. And then Geraldine, as an undergraduate, what you think that education barriers or the things to call out about that would be? Yeah, so 
I um, initially went to school for human nursing to become an RN. I soon realized that that was not a true passion of mine. Um, realized that animals are where it's at, where it always will be at for me. Um, and I switched um, from becoming a Bachelor of Science in Nursing to Science and Biology with hopes of going on to vet school. Unfortunately, though, that was not in the cards for me. I realized fast that, A, I didn't um, want to spend all that time in school. B, I couldn't afford all that time in school. Um, I was fortunate enough up until then to receive several scholarships. Um, but going on past my bachelor's, I knew there wouldn't be as many opportunities. And C, I don't want to be a vet. I am happy where I am. They have to make a lot of hard decisions. I'm going to be the one to support their decision to get those treatments done for them. And so going to school um, as a vet tech is a little bit different. It's an associate of science degree or applied science degree. Um, and my schooling was about five semesters long and plus a summer internship. And it's, um, it's, it's still hard to be in higher education or higher, excuse me, like post high school education, um, especially when you're a person of color. You don't find very many opportunities where you feel like you fit in. Or in my case, um, growing up in high school, I was, because I lived in town, I was too white for the native kids and too native for the white kids. And it, I felt like that really, um, Kind of played a role on how I viewed education and viewed finding places and luckily now I have this wonderful group but education is tough there's a lot of barriers financially finding your place um and finding mentors I know our question of the day is who was your mentor who made you realize you could do it um luckily I found um a Malax elder well not really an elder he's kind of an in-between elder um but um, that showed me a bunch of different volunteer opportunities with um, involving the University of Minnesota Veterinary School, a student organization through them that um, goes to different reservations in Minnesota providing clean care and wellness clinics. Um, and it's um, just him inviting me down to the Mille Lacs Indian Reservation in central Minnesota. That opened so many doors for me through volunteering. So that's actually how I met um, Summer, Alicia, Dr. Taylor. Um, and just being able to find someone that sticks or that sticks with you that will help you through these things that's not going to give up on you. Um, so, so that's what a big barrier is, is finding your person, finding your community. And those mentors are super important. And yes, Kayla, I do call myself an elder now, so thank you very much. <laughs> I was able to join the call a little bit later, so thank you so much. I appreciate I appreciate the, uh, the thought there. Thank you, Dr. Lauren. And I see it's so wonderful to see my two uh, Fort Collins counterparts again on this call here. It was nice to see you and uh, from that opportunity to speak up there, too. So thanks to Dr. Bernstein again. It's amazing where moccasins get to travel for speaking. So Thank you so much, Monty. I'm glad you could join. Um, going to go ahead and go to Jerry Lane. And I want to talk about what barriers you're seeing for the undergraduates coming to college. Yeah, well, yeah, there's been many barriers. <laughs> um, so first of all, yeah, like, um, like I mentioned before, I don't really travel out of state. I just really, um, I guess before going to college, I spent a lot of time on the reservation and I never really like, like, would say like I went to a summer camp, like to this location or I never, I never really got that exposure when I was younger. So um, coming to Las Cruces, where I'm currently going to school now, um, I got a culture shock. I am Native, and I didn't think I could get culture shock, but it was just um, a vast diversity of people um, 
that goes to school here from the Latinx side, the um the white people and um African Americans and you know just like other people like that. And it was just like a little shocking just because again there wasn't a lot of native students that or there wasn't a lot of um a lot of brown people in general. So um that was like a a barrier in itself. It's just again there's not someone who looks like me. There's not someone who is from the same town as me. And yeah, there were a few of my high school classmates who um, were able to get into the same college as I was, but um, unfortunately they weren't able to um, pass the first semester or pass the their first year just because of how challenging college can be and how lonely it could be after um, spending so much time at home and um, on your reservation. So um, being in a predominantly white um, college, especially if um, it's an agriculture school, um, there's a lot of competition. And of course, um, I am at a kind of at a default. I'm a little behind um, against my other classmates as we're all trying to compete into getting into vet school. And there were some um, times that I felt that um, my instructors didn't um, look at me the same as as another student would like, or I would just feel um, some type of uh, like, um, what's the word? Uh, not racism, because I feel like that's a little extreme. Um, but I just felt I just um I was being I felt that I was being treated differently and um but in retrospect like it's gonna be hard like being in a native student is gonna be hard um but that's also how you can stand out um I have a colorful background we all have um culturally rich backgrounds and so using that to our advantage, that could really um, help us stand out. And um, just being a college student and being like the only native person in my classroom, I can, that's what encourages me to um, keep driving towards my goal, um, which is becoming a veterinarian. So I'm like, I really get emotional at this part, <laughs> but, um, but yes, this is, um, one of the challenges is, of course, the the decrease in native populations in colleges, but um, but hopefully we can um, kind of switch the narrative and to say like, oh, it's because like I'm from the res, I have this, I'm behind on so many things, I'm not as smart as my other classmates, but no, it's it's what makes you different and what makes you stand out. So um, that's one of the barriers I have to change. And um, being part of Natives and Vet Men, it just gave me a sense of belongingness and um, just coming home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and being vulnerable. There's a challenge to college period in the fact that if you even get to that point and being able to go, that there's a whole set of changes that you have to be aware of, financial, um, as well as your mental health and your spiritual health. What is really common in a lot of the societies of Native populations, of Indigenous populations, is having this really strong, deep sense of community and lots and lots of togetherness. And so when we take these individuals out of that and place them in a place where they're marginalized and they feel alone and they don't have mentorship, then we really decrease the ability for them to succeed. So if you're not one of those people experiencing it, try to be one of those people mentoring it and supporting it and creating the space for people to get the support that they need in order to be successful because they're completely capable of it. But the support's not always there. And so I love to hear you guys' story that that is why this group is here, that you're able to be that community, that support for people along the journey. I'm going to ask a few of you guys to share what would be your long-term 
hopes, dreams, or goals for natives in vet med? Summer, what do you think? I would love for us to be kind of like the resource for other native students who are also on this journey. Um, we're actively working on like adding um, like a scholarship list to our site. We are trying to host pre-veterinary webinars for pre-vet students getting ready to apply for the VIMCAS or the veterinary school application. Um, I just really want us to be kind of a place that whether you're a pre-vet student, a vet student, vet tech student, anything like that, you're able to come to us and that we have a network of mentors um, who are able to offer things like internships at their hospitals or different opportunities like that. Um, kind of leaping off of what Gerilyn had said, right? Like for her in Navajo Nation, there's not a lot of clinics around for her to get that experience. And that seems to be the theme. I had a chat with another student over in Standing Rock, and she said that for her, the closest clinic for her to get her tech hours in is about an hour away. And so I just really want us to be able to have a place, like a centralized location for students to come to us and say, hey, I need this number of hours and I really want it to be in small animal. Can we find somewhere for to place me basically? And that we can say, yes, we can. We can not only con uh, connect you with those people, but we can also like financially support your travel there. We can help you with your lodging there, that type of thing. So that we we can really just, just uplift each other, support each other in our journeys. I love that. Lisa, what about you? Yeah, um, to continue on with what summer um, being the kind of resource hub for indigenous students on this journey into vet med, um, I hope with, these increased resources and sense of community that we increase representation um, and seeing um, like we went to a clinic and there was a little girl who came in with her mom in the morning and saw Summer and asked if she was the doctor and it was one of the cutest things I ever saw um, and but realizing that I don't remember ever growing up seeing someone who looked like me in that position. And I don't remember getting the resources um, or getting told that it was a little ambitious what I wanted to do, that I should have backup plans. Um, and so I'm hoping we can change that narrative into we should be the ones in these positions, um, especially with these new One Health models coming out and all these things that actually really just stem back to Indigenous practices. Um, so showing that we, um, that increasing representation overall is going to not only be a benefit for indigenous communities to resource their, themselves, but also increasing representation in the vet med field is going to shift the field into um, a much needed shift. I think that we are slowly going towards, but I would like to see it just a little bit faster, a little bit more representation. As I feel like indigenous people in that shift into a BIPOC focus where the where the last kind of shift is showing. So that's what I hope to see with them with Native Development. I love that that um marginalization within the marginalized is is compounding that for sure. Geraldine, what about your long-term hopes and goals for Native Inventment? Um I really see the um Natives in Met Med um, expanding to different states across the country to different reservations and um, becoming just like yeah the main resource for clinics and being able to have a mobile clinic to where we can travel to different parts of the reservation and furthering help our people and our animals. That is exciting. Sign me up. When are we getting the mobile unit? Let's go. Um, I know that a lot of people on this call are probably wondering, how can they help? Um, how can people or individual you know, or within organizations or as whole organizations, how can they support Natives and Vet Med? Lisa? Yeah, um, so um, funding, grant opportunities um, are a big thing. And 
I know, at least for myself, it was very intimidating to go to conferences and be in a position where I am trying to network for funding for my group that I love and I'm so passionate about, but it's so nerve wracking because the imposter syndrome of, do I really deserve this grant? Um, and I really do appreciate Maddie's one for being one of the, our first partnerships um, for grant opportunities as it really implemented that. I was like, okay, we are doing good work that people are seeing and we are making difference. Um, so funding um, is a big thing that we are looking for. Um, and if your organization wants to sponsor something specific like travel funds um, for clinics or for experiences for indigenous students, um, that is a big aspect of what we're trying to do now is uh, get more outreach for indigenous students. Um, for example, we're hoping to do our clinic in Sisseton um, in August. That could be an opportunity that your organization could sponsor. Um, so. Awesome. Thank you. Kayla? How else can people support? So, yeah, so not only monetarily, but like Lisa just mentioned, we're hoping to start our own clinics where um, we don't necessarily rely so heavily on other um, organizations and other groups. So um, donating supplies, whether that be syringes, needles, hemostats, um, bandages, scissors, stuff like that. Um, that's another important thing that people can consider donating. Um, and one of the big um, dreams that I know several of us in Naves of Men have is once everybody's, um, or a lot of people are assessed and become DVM, CBT, all that good stuff, um, having our own mobile unit where we travel around to different reservations um, across country that are able to put on spay and neuter wellness clinics for um, places that don't necessarily have the resources, can't get to the resources, um, or resources that don't necessarily um, come to their reservation. And that's an important place that we can start is just providing, um, having people help us provide those supplies for us to pr put on the clinics. Summer, how else? Um, I think if you are maybe a veterinarian on here and you are able to offer like even just your mentorship time, for example, sometimes we get students who are interested in like, I really want to work with like exotics, you know, and we can be able, we can, I would love for us to be able to say, we know somebody who can talk to you about that. And they even have an internship opportunity for you for like a week long internship if you want. So um, like offering up that, for example, so we can start to really expand our mentorship network. Um, and then also to like, just if you are hosting an event, like whether, because I know that like there's places all over the country, right? I know some big ones tend to be like Navajo Nation. Um, a lot of the reservations in North Dakota, South Dakota, over in kind of like, um, like my neck of the woods for like Sistin, right? Like, so around North Dakota, South Dakota, places like that. If you're hosting clinics in any of those areas, it, um, it would be great if you could just reach out to Natives and Vet Med and say, hey, you know, we would love to have a few of your students, whether they're pre-vet students, vet assistants, think, um, vet students, come and um, volunteer because we do have like uh, regional representatives. And so they are able to reach out to students within their area to say, hey, this opportunity is happening um, if you're interested in coming. Okay. I uh, know and one there's one more big way, Geraldine. Uh yes. Um so we're saving um funding and scholarships from organizations who would help um with our animals and help those who are um coming into veterinary medicine. Those scholarships really do help a lot. And that's how I was able to travel out to South Dakota. Um I was able to receive a scholarship from um one of our organizations that I knew that men do have a partnership with and they were able to fly me and another student out. And yeah, so receiving funding just so we can go out and get experience um, outside our homelands would be great. 
Awesome. And that was certainly something that worked really well is people who wanted to have a particular thing to sponsor. That was absolutely a perfect solution is to say this um, group, which was Red Rover for Geraldine, to say we were going to sponsor this one or two students for this particular trip. So really the options are, are open to be creative. And so one of those things, how we've talked about multiple times, how do you get a hold of them? How do you reach out to natives in BetMed? Um, Kayla, could you walk us through um, how to navigate the, the website and how people can connect? Yeah, so as um, one of our other mentors, Mari Lou, is putting in the group chat um, there and other people are putting in the group chat as well, we now have a website, which is www.nativesinvetmed.org. Um, we are also active on Facebook and Instagram at Natives and Vet Med, and we have an email address as well that we can um, respond to from. And on our website, it's a newer website, one of our, our treasurer helped put it, that together, and there are many, um, several tabs. There's a membership tab where you request to be a member. Um, so if anybody knows any um, native students going through vet school, pre-vet school, vet tech school, vet assistant, um, internships and whatnot. Um, they can apply to be one of our members and, or if you yourself is a native or even a veterinarian, um, community liaison, they can all volunteer or apply to be a member. We also have a news and stories tab where you can see what we've been doing lately. Um, I think we got a technical issue. We're having trouble hearing you, Kayla. Um, let's see. I wonder if Dr. Taylor, you can maybe. Right. Sorry, Kayla, if you can hear us, we can't hear you. Um, so try to figure that out, but, um, I think she's definitely probably just elaborating on that. A lot of that information is available on the website. There's some beautiful pictures of these amazing humans and many others like them, uh, doing the work in the community. Um, I cannot thank you all, all enough for being here and joining us today. Um, and I know you guys are busy and taking that time out of your schedule to come and share with this group of humans. Um, it's just been a joy to be a part of this team and to support these guys in their journey. If there are questions, we would be more than happy to see if we can field those. Um, I did see one that I wanted to make sure that we um, did address is someone had mentioned in the group about being prepared for college and how that was very difficult as Geraldine shared is, are there any plans in Natives and Vet Med to work with high schools or, or children in the the pre-college era in the high school and elementary to work on that. Summer? Yeah, so actually that's one of one of the really big things that I want to get started. Um, and so just kind of by a stroke of luck almost, I had gone down to CSU Spur campus um, and it is a separate campus from the Fort Collins campus where the veterinary school is. But down at Spur, they have a building that is called Vita. It's actually a really cool building, if any of you looked it up. Um, and it's a partnership between, like, Dumb Friends League Alliance. And then, um, like, we have, there's an equine hospital there. And it's basically a clinic, a low-cost clinic that's open to the public. They even have, like, a viewing room. And so families and students, youth, like little kids, they can all go to this building and they're able to watch surgeries live. They, there's like a really big like interactive portion. There's like virtual reality. There's like all this cool stuff there, this stuff there. And I saw that they had a youth camp. And so I was like, hey, it'd be really cool for Natives of that bed to partner with CSU. So I reached out to one of my professors from last, my first year who um, helps to run one of the programs. And initially I was just like, hey, like, do you have any like ideas like on how we can get something like this started? Like, I'm really curious. Like, we don't really know like any of the logistics, like if you could just give any advice. Um, she's running um, a summer youth camp 
for high school students ages 14 to 17. And she immediately was like, hey, call me. And so I called her and she was like, I have these spots available. If you can get people to apply to them, I will prioritize them. They will have first spot, first pick. We cover their travel, we cover their lodging, we cover their meals, everything, and they can come to this camp. And so just by talking with her, we got out all the information on our Facebook page within like a day or two, emailed a bunch of schools. I am, as of right now, I haven't checked in to see if there have been a lot of students who applied just because it was really short notice. But she said she's willing to do it, continue doing that for future years where if we get the, if we get it out, she will prioritize Native applicants through us um, and they are able to come to this youth camp hosted right here in Fort Collins. So that's, yeah, it, it we're working on it. It happened really fast, but I'm glad that we're able to be, do that and help students kind of transition into college. Thanks. Jose, Janet, are there any other questions that you're seeing in the chat? I didn't see any other questions, just beautiful, everyone. And I'll, I'll hand it off to my friend, Shannon, who's going to close us out today. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. It's been amazing, so moving. I've been fighting back my tears. Geraldine, I know that you will be successful. Keep it up. Let's continue this conversation on Maddie's Fund. And we so look forward to hearing all of your successes. And I know that you're going to receive a lot of support going forward from this call. Thank you all yeah. very much. Thank you all. We'll see you May 6th. Get out of my eye, everybody.